Glad to hear it. All right, cool. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for thanks for being here. Thanks for tuning in. Um, oh, oh my gosh. Oh, I I think this is it's got some like timing thing. Uh, I re record I record I, I recorded this at one point. I think it has automated slide timings. I hope that doesn't happen again. If the slides keep changing, we might have to drop out and come back. So, but regardless, here we are. Thanks for um, thanks for coming in and uh, I love these virtual conferences actually it's been really great because I feel like I get to to reach a lot more people and talk to a lot more people and it's way easier for me to walk down to my basement than it is to uh, hop on an airplane so I get to do more of them as well so it's I, I actually really enjoy this um, I'm going to give this talk uh, on the present and future of Kubernetes um, I wanted to say that this is there's a lot in here that I think is my opinion uh, I don't want to, you know, I, I worry a little bit that people will come away from this saying, oh, this is the roadmap. And it's definitely not um, for in many respects, because the roadmap is really dictated by the community itself, of which I am really at this point an observer. Um, and so this is some of my ideas, but uh, they are not, I, you know, I don't think anybody should take this as like, this is going to be the 1.20 release of Kubernetes or anything else like that. This is really just things that I'm thinking about. All right, so where are we right now? Well, uh, Kubernetes is in all of the clouds. You know, we're, we're hitting about six years into this project at this point, or six years out in the public for this project. Um, there's been a ton of the interest, and I guess that's obvious at this point, but, but it's important to realize that, you know, it, it wasn't always this way. And I think in, in this moment, when we start thinking about this, it's really important to point out to people that it's, it is again about the, the force of community that is the reason why this thing happened. It's 90,000 commits out there, and that's just in the core repo, came from people all over the world. And that's a pretty amazing thing to think about. Um, as, as well as some of the things like the meetups where you see people locally at the grassroots organizing in their local communities. Um, it's really been an amazing ride, personally speaking. Uh, I don't get you know too many opportunities to say this, but it's, it's, it's been a, an, an unbelievable ride for me personally. And I know on behalf of all of the other folks, on behalf of Craig and Joe and everybody really who's been involved in the community from the get go, I think we really want to say thank you. So hopefully now I don't know where, you know, every one of you came to this project at a different time, um, maybe voluntarily, maybe because your company said, hey, we're going to go do this cloud native thing. Um, but regardless of why you came out to Kubernetes, uh, I, I really want to personally say thank you. Um, it's been an amazing experience for me so far and I hope that it's going to continue to be an amazing experience. Um, as we think about this uh, experience, what I want to, to say is take a look back and this is the past part of the talk to say, you know, now that we're in six years and we're in this place, how did we get here, right? What is the reason that we're in this place? The themes that I want to think about as we go through this are this transition to API driven infrastructure and immutable architecture as well as um, these uh, patterns of cloud deployment, meaning like how do we actually think about delivering software and as well as continuous software delivery. Because I think these are at this point in some ways sort of obvious parts of what it means to be cloud native, but it's really important to think back and realize that six years ago or seven years ago, these were kind of very novel concepts. I mean, things that people had been thinking about um, but not something that a lot of people were talking about. And so I think it's important to, as we think about the past, context contextualize our mind back into that world that, uh, that existed previously um, and think about where we were starting. And, you know, when I started working in cloud, uh, in public cloud, um, this was pretty much state of the art, right? You were going to SSH into deploy software, you were going to SSH into a machine, you were going to maybe run some scripts if you were lucky. If you weren't lucky, you were going to type in some commands that you cut and pasted from a website. Um, you were going to think about distributing your software in terms of tarballs or zips. Uh, and the servers that you were creating were these snowflakes, right? These, I, one of the very first talks that I gave in this space, I had this picture of a, you know, a melting snowflake. And, and it's this amazingly beautiful thing. But at the same time, you know for certain that as it disappears, it's gone. Right? It's gone for good and it's not coming back. And I think we all acknowledge that in that world, it was pretty scary, right? People who are afraid to make changes to their software, people who are afraid to roll out a new version, afraid to even fix a bug for fear that it might introduce more bugs or might introduce, you know, destabilize your solution. I think 
you know, one of the tragedies at some level is that this, this continues. I think it's gotten a lot better, um, but we need to keep on thinking about this. In that time frame, in that scary world, I think that one of the interesting things that happened was that Netflix was starting to talk about this idea of immutable infrastructure. I'm sure there were other people, but my memory at the time was that Netflix started to say, hey, look, we're cutting these VM images, we're deploying these VM images. We never change anything. We just change the build pipeline, push, push everything through again, build new VM images. Um, and really kind of getting out front with this idea of immutable architecture. And I think this is one of the first examples of people seeing something, really liking the ideas and just not adopting it, right? No, I mean, some people started to adopt immutable infrastructure, but it was really challenging because building a VM image was heavyweight, very, very heavyweight. Um, the tooling was worse than it is today and it's still not a great experience today. Um, debugging and deploying and managing these as a developer, the developer experience of VM-based immutable infrastructure was just a real problem. It was, it was just way too heavy for people to really feel like they were being effective moving forward. But into that world of immutable infrastructure and these ideas that you should be driving things through a pipeline, um, what happened was, you know, Docker containers came along and Docker said, hey, look, you can have that immutable thing you can have that unchangeable artifact that's built by a development pipeline, but you can also have a developer oriented tool, tool chain and a developer oriented workflow, right? Where you're not gonna have to build a 600 megabyte uh, image file just to run a change that you compile locally, right? You're not gonna have to wait 20 minutes for a VM image to push up to a cloud and run in order to test what's going on, right? And so I think that you're gonna be able to run more than three of these on your laptop at the same time. And I think for all of these reasons, the value of immutable architecture that had sort of been demonstrated before, as well as this um, uh, value of the container itself, is the reason that hockey stick came. And I wanted to take a look at sort of the reason for the hockey stick. And that's, you know, part of that is, is this very basic thing of image packaging, right? I think that everybody, this is why everybody came to Docker in the first place. Um, because when it used to be when you built stuff on your laptop and then you deployed it to the cloud, it looked a little bit different, right? So like, yeah, the pieces are roughly the same, but you know, it didn't quite run exactly the same as it did uh, on your laptop. And of course, that's a really big problem if you're pushing out to production. Instead, I think when it's important to remember that the container came along and it said, hey, look, that thing you ran on your laptop, it looks and feels and smells exactly the same on the cloud, right? I think this now seems obvious and probably at this point people are, are, are tuning out and starting to web browse because they're bored with the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm talking about these aspects of containers that everybody already knows. But the thing is, that was a problem you needed to solve. And another problem you needed to solve was this idea of image distribution. You needed to be able to push your zip file or whatever it was around the world so that you could deploy into multiple regions. That problem is now solved. Nobody really wanted to solve that problem. That's kind of a, you know, a necessary problem to solve on the, way towards, uh, on the way towards running your application. But now it's a solved problem that we don't have to spend our brain power on. That's a huge step forward, right? So I think we need to really take a step back and acknowledge the transitions that led us along the way so that now you can actually take an image, build it on a laptop, push it up to Azure Container Registry, immediately it's geo-distributed around the world, pull it down to a machine in the cloud or a physical machine on the edge somewhere, and know for certain that it's going to run exactly the same as it did on the laptop. I think we, as developers, like to complain a lot and talk about how, you know, it's, the problems are all hard and nothing ever changes, but this alone is a major step forward that we have managed to achieve in the cloud management uh, of our software. The final piece that was the sort of in some ways the most important to me of Docker's rise and the rise of the container and container image was this idea of the container as runnable thingy. So I, I think that the, you know, if there's a theme of building on top of libraries and building on top of services in computer science, one of the other themes that is really present is this idea of abstraction. And when I looked at the container, what I saw was an abstraction layer. It has a play button. It's like a cartridge. If anyone's old enough like me that they used a Commodore 64, we had these like plastic cartridges. You push the cartridge into the machine, the whole thing starts up, right? Um, and I saw the container like that. I don't care what's inside. It could be squirrels on hamster, you know, squirrels on hamster wheels or whatever. It doesn't really matter to me. All I know is if I take that container, we take that, that piece of, of code, push it into an environment, it will run. But all of this stuff, 
given that runnable thingy was insufficient, right? We needed something more than just a, a runnable piece that could run on an individual machine because any reliable distributed system, it actually requires a lot of machines. Um, and in order to manage software across a lot of machines, you need to actually treat all of those machines as sort of an abstract sea of compute. I don't want to see machines anymore. I want to see this universal, we called it logical compute uh, early in the early days. I want to sort of take all of those machines, grab them all together, aggregate all their CPUs, all their memory, turn them into something where, you know, I don't actually think about it very much. Um, and that's really where the Kubernetes API came along, right? So the Kubernetes API provides that abstraction layer that isolates me from this sea of compute that's underneath me um, and the runnable thingies that are on top, right? So this, this boundary between, um, you know, what, what the resources that are provided that I don't actually really care about and the applications that are on top that are the things I am actually interested in running is a really, really valuable abstraction. And I think over time we've seen as we push more into serverless and we push more into nodeless uh, Kubernetes with the virtual kubelet project that we're involved in, we're really seeing that people don't care about machines. It's just not interesting. What you care about is your application above it. Um, and so being able to separate an offshore that you know, cluster API and the management of machines to either a managed service in the case of the cloud uh, or a separate team within your company in the case of physical servers, um, that becomes a really powerful abstraction in order to, to develop your, your application. But it's not really just about hiding machines. I mean, I think we sort of, that was a place where we started, but when you're thinking about Kubernetes as an orchestrator, I think we wanna think about like what the orchestrator actually does, right? And that involves things like, uh, Self-healing, I think if you cast your mind back to that world of 2012 that I was talking about before, self-healing is something that wasn't really present. You know, even if you're using a tool like Chef or Puppet or Ansible or any of these tools, uh, they're kind of one-offs. They drive forward and they get to a certain state and then they're done. And if you need to do it again, you just sort of like put that in a loop and you hope that it all works. I think Kubernetes really introduced this idea of a, a self-healing and a self-tuning system. One of the analogies we always talked about was like a drone. You know, the difference between flying a remote controlled plane and flying a drone is that that, the, that quadcopter drone has logic on board. It has, a, it has a, a processor on board that's keeping it balanced, right? So that, you know, my five-year-old kid with an iPad could fly a quadcopter in a way that I could never have done when I was, a, you know, even a 15 year old trying to learn how to fly an RC plane with direct analog inputs. Okay, so that was the sort of the past part of Kubernetes. Um, and, you know, obviously we're six years in, it's a pretty mature product at this point, you know, so, you know, I guess we're done. Well, it turns out, I mean, I guess at some level, good for job security, we're never really done. Uh, we're never really, you know, the, the tasks that we've completed are not really the, the, the end of, of everything. And so as we look into the future, the things that I want everybody to be thinking about are how can we learn less? Um, how can we, you know, I think right now we're in this world where in order to successfully deploy an application, you have to know all the things. You have to sort of learn all the things, know all the things um, and do all the things. Um, and that's problematic because, you know, even the best of us have a limited amount of brain power to, uh, to keep everything in our head, if you're required to learn all of the bits and pieces, you're gonna forget stuff. Um, and also additionally, one of the problems is we don't standardize and share knowledge well enough. Um, we don't, you know, at this point we have books maybe that describe best practices. We have very little, you know, institutional implementations that effectively turn the best practices into live things. We're starting to do this with things like operators. We're starting down this path and there's sort of like, you know, the, the quote that the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. Um, we're starting to see the pieces coming together, but this is a really important thing that I think has been true throughout computer science is that we really start to step forward when we start to be able to stand on the shoulders of giants, right? If we're all just building our own infrastructure at the bottom, we don't, we spend way too much time building the same things in different silos and not enough time building on top. Um, and that kind of leads to the final bit, which is this idea of using concepts instead of building them. 
Uh, you know, I think we all think about things like algorithms, like search algorithms or AI algorithms. We go in through and we learn them. You know, you might learn a search algorithm in uh, undergraduate. You might learn, uh, you know, a machine learning, a deep learning machine learning algorithm in graduate school or in, you know, a statistics course or something like that. But almost none of us actually write those algorithms. And that's not a bad thing. That's actually a really good thing because it means we can take that concept of search or we can take that concept of deep learning and we can apply it to a problem that we need to solve for our company or for our personal projects. And we don't have to spend the you know, significant amount of time that it would take to, to implement that algorithm. Additionally, I think it's really important because that ability is also pretty inclusive. Um, and so it makes us people who are not capable of writing those algorithms capable of, uh, I sort of jumped the slide ahead, sorry, um, capable of using algorithms, even though they might not be able to implement them and that's important. As we look to the future and trying to achieve those goals, one of the things I like to think about is this idea of cluster services, right? I think when we think about the cluster, it's both a place where your application runs, but it's also a place where we have the ability to encode some best practices. We have the ability to lighten the developer's load, provide them with capabilities that they may need without them really having to do anything except for deploy into that environment. It's a huge win relative to doing stuff on our own, on our own infrastructure, because suddenly we have services just like we do in the cloud, but within a cluster that we can rely on, right? Just because you pushed your code into that cluster, suddenly things light up. Um, and the benefit of that is not just that you have to learn less, but that also the solution that is implemented is consistent across your company. So take for, you can take, for example, you know, something like monitoring. I think one of the challenges that many people face when they think about something like monitoring is that oftentimes this is what the teams look like, right? One team is gonna choose one version of monitoring, another team is gonna choose another version of monitoring, and the third team hasn't even thought about monitoring, right? And so this really represents the, 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 the problem space. If you let individual teams make individual choices, they're gonna find different solutions, not because one is necessarily better than the other, but just because different teams choose different things. And then also because you're forcing everybody to make their decisions, um, there are people who won't do it. And the people who are in responsible for consistency, the, you know, the SREs in your org or the people who are responsible for production hygiene uh, are suddenly tasked with the impossible task of sort of herding all of the cats together. That's, that's a pretty terrible thing. If we instead think about monitoring as a cluster service, then something like Azure Monitor or whoever your favorite monitoring solution is runs within the cluster itself. And when a developer comes along and says, hey, I'm gonna create some pods, Azure Monitoring or whatever your monitoring daemon is actually is also watching that API server and it notices that you've gotten some pods. It actually can then go scrape through a common open source interface, like something like Prometheus, which is sort of emerging as the de facto standard for exposing metrics. So that, you know, whether it's Azure Monitor or anything else, they can all focus in on the same way of exposing metrics in an application. And if you deploy, you know, a piece of library code, it will be monitorable no matter what cloud it is in. Having monitored that information, it can then push it up to a software as a service, because you really don't want to be running monitoring yourself. Um, is very mission critical data. It's a hard thing to do. You know, using whatever a monitoring service is available to you is, a, is, a, is the right thing to do. Um, and again, the value of, of this is that the developer has done nothing at this point. Developer might not even know that their code is being monitored at this point, right? They've simply gone and deployed to this Kubernetes thing. Metrics are starting to be collected so that with, when and if there's a problem, with their application and they need to introspect it, the first step of introspection isn't, oh, did you add monitoring? No, okay, go ahead, add monitoring and then hope the problem reoccurs. But it is rather, you know, let's have uh, monitoring uh, available when the developer needs it. And likewise, let's expose it for visualization through open source tooling like Grafana so that, you know, we can build and share um, that same standardization can happen with community dashboards as well as with the code we run, because it's you know, really great to share implementations of algorithms, but actually things like visualization are almost, you know, are, are equally challenging to build and exactly the kinds of things that, that we should share and collaborate on. All right, so hopefully that gives you an idea of the, um, 
the space of cluster services and monitoring is not the only example of this. There's a lot of really great examples of things like security uh, or other, you know, kind of things that you want to be ubiquitous in your cluster environment and apply to every single application that's ever deployed. And that really you don't want to have to train developers on, right? Um, and so hopefully it inspires you to think about that. I want to take a look at the other side of things, which is how can we actually set up developers and set up clusters for success? Because we talk about the cluster services being present on those clusters, but how do we make sure that those cluster services are there in the first place? How do we make sure that the cluster environment is a consistent landing zone, a consistent experience, whether you know, every airport in the world looks and feels the same, regardless of whether um, you know, you're landing in North America or you're landing in the South Pacific. Right? There's a lot of consistency in, in everything that we do. That doesn't happen by accident. That happens because of international standards and everything else like that. Right? So how can we apply those same kind of ideas to uh, the clusters that we're building? Because I think that while I was talking earlier about how we are trying to um, drive snowflakes out of the servers with immutable infrastructure, right now in many cases, the world of Kubernetes clusters, yeah, every machine is consistent, but the clusters themselves have become those snowflakes that we were trying to worry about in the in the first stage, right? So every single cluster, there's a different version of Helm running. There's a different version of monitoring running. There's, you know, maybe some services are actually missing, right? So how can we actually think about not just having eliminated snowflakes for our servers and not just having eliminated, you know, snowflake applications with containers and Kubernetes, but how can we actually think about eliminating snowflake clusters as well? Because of course, differences like this are the sorts of things that cause production outages, right? In my experience, it's never been the case that, you know, uh, people go and push software that they know is broken. Outages happen because software is deployed into an environment that doesn't match with your expectations or because there's differences, right? Like it was, you ran it in the canary test and then you run it in prod and it's, it's a, it's a problem. Right. So I think that this example of um, Snowflake clusters really il illustrates, you know, how we approach open source within Azure. Um, we try and be driven by our customers. Right. And so we have customers coming to us and saying, hey, I've got all these Kubernetes clusters, some on prem, some in other clouds, some in Azure. How can we manage them and get rid of the snowflakes? And so we took that pain, that unhappy customer on the left. Um, we turned it into an open source project. Uh, and then having turned it into an open source project, we brought it back into uh, Azure in, as an Azure product, right? And that open source project was this idea of policy, right? And in fact, we went and said, hey, look, there's this problem in Kubernetes today, which is that if I have RBAC, I can block truly malicious actors from accessing my cluster, right? RBAC and access control can take, you know, those people I don't know about, and I can, you know, out on the internet, out on the wilds of the internet, and I can block them. I can lock them out. But there's a lot of stuff that that nice person is, uh, is doing, that trusted person is doing, that um, can be problematic as well. And it's not because they're malicious necessarily, it's because they're making mistakes, right? So, oops, sorry, I skipped that. Um, so for example, that person's deploying software. You trust that person, they're deploying software, but where did the image come from? How can we make sure that the image only comes from your registry and not from random code out on Docker Hub? Um, or some more sort of like process oriented stuff like, hey, you're exposing something on the public internet. Uh, did you get a security review for it? Um, and then finally, you know, so even just sort of basic metadata that enables automation, like, hey, there's this deployment out here. Uh, what's the mailing list of the team that goes along with it so that I can build automation that might scan for vulnerabilities or detect, you know, uh, under-resourced uh, under applications and, and take mitigation action or send email reminders to people to, to ask them to take mitigation action, right? So I think these are all great examples of capabilities that you need to produce a consistent experience of a cluster, but that are not possible in a default Kubernetes config, right? So the, the answer to how we figure out all of these questions is policy, right? And so that open source project that we started um, based on customer need is this, has become a project under the open policy agent known as Gatekeeper, 
right? And so this open source project implements policy for Kubernetes, is available to Kubernetes users anywhere, and has actually developed a pretty vibrant community around it. Um, but as we've gone and, you know, invested in that project, and as the community has rallied around that project, we're also taking it back into Azure and making it an Azure product, because with something like policy, when you're thinking about eliminating all of those snowflakes, you really want to have a single source of truth. You want to have a single place to update a policy and have it push out to every single cluster that you're running in the world, right? So that if you, um, uh, you know, if you make a change in the policy configuration file, the whole point of it is to deliver consistency and deliver consistent experience. So you really don't want to have to be in the business of making a change on every single cluster, because if you do it that way, you're going to be right back in the world of, uh, of Snowflakes, right? And so you know, Azure provides a central point of truth for that. Other people uh, do similar sorts of things. Um, the key point is to say, you know, as we think about implementing uh, a consistent consistency across our clusters, we really want that, that top level global, uh, global control. All right, so hopefully I talked a little bit about how we manage our clusters itself, but I haven't really talked very much about um, developing the, the more people being able to develop and deploy applications in Kubernetes, or even to make it easier for people to design and build applications on Kubernetes, because for everything that Kubernetes has done to make it easier to operate these applications, um, it really hasn't materially made it easier to build applications. Um, and, and I think that's a big problem, partially because even if you know what you're doing, it's, it takes too much time, right? It takes too much time, you have to remember too many things. But I think even more importantly, we need to just broaden the base. We just need to make cloud native application development uh, more inclusive to people who may not be um, you know, even professional developers. There's been a lot of talk, you know, as everybody's kind of come home and remote work has become increasingly important and remote tools have become increasingly important. The importance of the citizen developer, the importance of the, per, you know, the teacher who's suddenly teaching a classroom full of third graders from their house, they need to be able to build applications too. And right now, the fact of the matter is that in many cases, it's just simply too hard to build those applications, right? And it's because of all of these things, right? when we think about distributed systems, we very occasionally teach those concepts. I mean, in, I went through undergrad, we didn't even talk about distributed systems. I, and from talking to people who've gone through undergrad more recently, maybe a little bit, maybe one class, right? But it's not really something we teach a lot of. But more importantly, even if we teach them stuff, every single time um, we think about it, we force people to implement these things over and over and over again. Even myself, I've implemented the same ideas repeatedly because there just aren't good libraries, right? There just aren't good solutions. If I wanna do fan out or if I wanna do um, anything else, I have to do this. And then the other piece of this is that as I think about building one of these services, there's th there are frameworks that exist, but they tend to be monolithic silos, right? If I wanna go do functions as a service, that functions as a service experience is this sort of self-contained silo. If I want to do sort of a 12 factor style, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, a uh, static web app style web app, that feels like a silo too. And then of course, obviously people now know that they can go into containers, but while that's more free, they know that they're kind of giving up a lot of the help or the help, excuse me, not the help, the help, right? So, and, and I talk to so many people who are really worried about this decision. And the reason they're worried about it isn't because they're, they're necessarily, you know, uh, worried about, about the decision itself. They're worried about what the next three years will look like because they really feel like this decision is a big decision, right? And it really shouldn't be. There's no reason why this should be such a big choice. It's because of the way we've built our systems, right? Oops, sorry. Um, we've built our systems around this, these silos where the only commonality at the base is something like x86, right? Where functions is built all the way down to the metal, web apps is built all the way down to the middle, and no code solutions are built all the way down, Jamstack is built all the way down, right? And, and they don't interoperate, they don't share componentry, they don't always even share components. You know, something could call it a service in one place, Kubernetes calls it a service, a function might call it an endpoint, you know, who, 
who really cares, right? What, what we need to have consistency uh, of, an, of naming across all these things. Because again, if I want to learn less, one way that I get to learn less is by not having as much to learn. The other way that I learn less is by having my learning be more portable, right? And right now, if you learn how to build a really great Jamstack app, you know, it's not clear that you're gonna learn very much about how to build a Heroku app. Or if you build a really great no code solution, it's really unclear that you're gonna learn anything about how to build something in functions, right? And that's a big problem as well, right? If, if every single silo has its own jargon and everything, every single silo has its own, um, you know, sort of set of concepts, even if they map across, you have to learn the mapping, right? Um, and, and that means that it's inherently, you're inherently gonna build smaller communities because they're gonna each live in each of these silos. The other problem is this idea of cliffs, right? So it's one thing to be living in a silo and have to learn more or maybe not have access across the silos. Um, the other thing that happens is that software is a living thing, right? Software is something that uh, goes for, you know, isn't just an instantaneous moment in time. And so when people are making that choice and thinking of it as such a big choice, one of the things that they're really worried about is this idea that they're gonna get stuck um, on a cliff and they won't have a way back down. Right. So I think that if we think about the way that we're approaching these platforms as instead as saying, hey, look, we're going to not just build on top of x86, we're going to actually build on top of Kubernetes and we're going to actually build on top of containers. And then we're going to provide programming language experiences on top of those things. Suddenly we open the door to the fact that like a service is a service is a service, whether it's been a service that was built in no code or a service that was built in a Jamstack or a service that was built in a 12 factor app. They're all actually Kubernetes services. Service discovery works between these silos. Secrets work between these silos. All of this auto scaling is the same auto scaling between these silos. All of the componentry that is the basic pieces um, is shared and consistent. And that's a huge step forward. We're starting to see this happen today. Um, it's not happening enough, but it's getting there. Um, and also this eliminates the cliff problem because you can always sort of eject out to raw Kubernetes um, if you run into problems. Right. Um, so this is sort of the stuff that is the wrappers on the outside of the application that you're writing. Um, the other piece that I think is really important to think about is what actually happens in the code itself. Right, what actually, what are we doing to make it easier for people to build, um, you know, to build those applications, not just run them out in Kubernetes, not just live inside of a functions as a service framework or in a Jamstack framework or whatever else it is. Like, what are we actually doing when the person's sitting down to write the code that, that makes their lives easier as well? Um, and I think one of the most powerful sort of things that came out of containerization, Kubernetes, is this idea of a sidecar. The reason that the sidecar is important is because, well, there's, I mean, there's actually multiple reasons. One of the reasons is that actually it, it is sort of a shared library that is itself packaged as a container. And this has really nice properties because it means that I can take that container and I can distribute it to you. And I can know that even if I built it on top of Fedora and you're running it on top of Debian, it's all gonna work. Um, I can actually program it in you know, some other language and it's going to work. And I also know that it's gonna get deployed and run immediately in the same network namespace. So I can use localhost. I don't have to worry about service discovery. I can you know, manipulate things if I need to intercept uh, network traffic. We've seen a lot of people do that for service mesh. Um, this notion of a sidecar container is something that has proven to actually be quite powerful. Um, and we've taken this idea with this, open source, with this open source project called Dapper, and we've actually turned it into a way of trying to implement an easier approach to coding, right? And so the idea behind Dapper is that actually our sidecar is gonna do most of the heavy lifting for doing things like talking to a storage provider, right? If you wanna figure out, hey, how do I talk to Cassandra or how do I talk to Redis or even how do I talk to a cloud service like Cosmos DB, Usually that involves reading a bunch, learning a bunch, dealing with the idiosyncrasies of the different pieces um, and authentication and a whole bunch of other stuff that can actually be a real barrier to entry for a lot of people. But at this point, most modern programming languages, making a web call, doing a get, 
Like in Python, you can teach a, you know, a, a, a middle schooler how to do a get in Python, right? It's just not that complicated to be able to do, uh, you know, let's say an unauthenticated get or an unauthenticated put requests library, take care of you, no worries. And it's true pretty much for every programming language, right? HTTP is, is really deeply rooted in the, in, and well supported in the libraries for TypeScript and Java, .NET, Go, and all these languages, right? So by effectively taking the problem of talking to storage and putting it in this dapper sidecar and then saying, hey, all the application needs to do is talk some basic HTTP with a JSON payload, um, between the on local hosts, so not worrying about authentication between the application and the sidecar, you know, we've actually really materially made it more straightforward for somebody to interface with storage. Right. And, and this is really just an example, right? It's not just about storage. It can also be about things like eventing. Right. So the same thing is true. You know, if I can do key value store, that's great. But a lot of times the applications that I want to build are going to respond to events. They're going to respond to things that, um, you know, are happening out in the world that are triggering on, uh, on my application. And so when we think about, uh, you know, the eventing protocols, Dapper can handle this as well, right? So that the events, instead of a request coming out from the application out through to the storage, an event is going to come the opposite direction. Kafka is going to trigger something. Kubernetes is going to trigger something. It will fire that event onto the sidecar. Sidecar will handle the details of unpacking the event or using the cloud event spec um, and then deliver a very simple message into a web server. And again, just like it's relatively straightforward for you know, that middle schooler to learn how to write a get, it's pretty easy at this point to also write a web handler. Not a fancy web handler, doesn't have authentication, may not even have rate limiting. Um, but a very simple, you know, uh, web handler, that's something that somebody can do with basic knowledge uh, of a programming language or a couple of tutorials, right? And so if all of the sort of the logic of scaling out and of rate limiting and all of the important stuff is handled by the sidecar, we've actually, again, meant that that developer who is really focused on accomplishing a task can do a lot less. Right, and learn a lot less. And therefore we've broadened the base of people who can possibly do it. Speaking of broadening the base as well, I think it's important to realize that lots and lots of different people are gonna come and program in lots of different languages. So one of the other real values of this sidecar approach, as well as um, you know, using HTTP, is that it allows for any language, right? Any language can be, any language that can do HTTP at this point, which is pretty much any language at this point. Um, can interface with this shared library. This is powerful both because it broadens the set of people who could use this library, but also more importantly, we don't end up with 20 different implementations for 20 different programming languages. We have one implementation so we can get all of the best practices, all of the energy of the community into a single place and then have that, multiply that out by uh, the breadth of programming languages. So I think the last thing that comes up with a lot of people when I talk about sort of broadening the tent and making it easier for people, people say, well, what about serverless, right? And I think that it's important that we think about the difference between a programming model versus getting rid of servers, right? And so, um, you know, all of the things that have been traditionally functions as a service have gotten wrapped up in serverless. But what happens if we remove those machines and actually make Kubernetes serverless? Well, all of those machines that we were there in that previous illustration of that sea of compute have vanished and have been replaced by the cloud and containers that run on the cloud. You know, but if we're doing it that way and the machines have gone, wasn't the whole origin story of Kubernetes all about being an orchestrator to manage those machines? Well, I think we can actually have it both ways, right? Where the orchestrator is gonna be responsible um, not just because as we've seen in the evolution of Kubernetes, the orchestration parts aren't really about managing the machines or aren't exclusively about managing the machines. They're also about orchestrating the application. And for the time being anyway, Kubernetes itself is actually kind of attached to the idea of a machine. But with the virtual kubelet project, we're actually starting to bridge the gap between serverless infrastructure that runs containers in a serverless way and a Kubernetes API that is expecting orchestration as something that it, orchestration of machines as something that it does. 
Um, and it's just an open source project that again is, is following that pattern of how Azure has think, thought about open source. Starts with a problem, people want serverless experiences, delivers an open source project in the virtual kubelet, which is now part of the CNCF, and then drives that back into the Azure product so that you can have access to that inside of, uh, inside of Azure. I think what's been amazing about um, the virtual kubelet project is actually we've seen some really unexpected partnerships with both, sorry, with both people starting to use this actually to deliver solutions to IoT devices out of the edge. Recently with delivering um, applications, managing applications in WebAssembly through Kubernetes. And we're hopeful that this is just going to continue because it turns out that the virtual kubelet API, in addition to being great for partnering with serverless applications, is also just an easier inter interface to implement than something like CRI. So one of the reasons the WebAssembly landed with us in virtual kubelet is that the interface was better suited to WebAssembly than CRI. And so again, this is an ongoing discussion that we're going to have out in the community, not done by any means. Um, and uh, but but one that we're really eager to help drive forward because we believe that it'll help broaden the base of people who can can use Kubernetes if they're no longer thinking about machines at all. All right. So in conclusion, um, you know, I think that the amazing thing that has happened is that Kubernetes over the last six years has transformed the way people operate applications. Um, I think we're going to hopefully over the next few years see how people change the way they build applications too. Thanks so much for listening. Um, and I'm done. <laughs>